Well, I'd invite you to turn with me in your Bibles at this time to Proverbs 27. Proverbs 27. So we concluded our series on John last week, and in a few weeks, we're going to be getting another new sermon series through the book of Philippians, which I am especially excited about because I think its overall message of pressing on, of always moving forward in the faith, of progressing in things like joy and evangelism and contentment and unity and serving others and so many other things. It is such a timely message, such a timely book. And so I'm looking forward to that. And I would just encourage you, as you anticipate that, starting that in a few weeks, to consider reading through the book of Philippians and maybe read through a couple times. It's very short, just four chapters, uh, just in preparing for that. But today we'll be looking at a passage from a very different book in a very different time that also contains, nevertheless, a very timely message message on a topic that I've been thinking a lot about lately, and that's the topic of friendship. A recent article from the Mayo Clinic points out the interesting connection between friendship and one's overall well-being. The authors write, good friends are good for your health. Friends can help you celebrate good times and provide support during bad times. Friends prevent isolation and loneliness and give you a chance to offer needed companionship too. Friendship also plays a significant role in promoting your overall health. Adults with strong social connections have a reduced risk of many significant health problems, including depression, high blood pressure, and an unhealthy body mass index. In fact, studies have found that older adults who have meaningful relationships and social support are likely to live longer than their peers with fewer connections. So clearly, friendship is a great benefit to one's physical and emotional well-being. But did you know that friendship is also incredibly helpful, a great benefit to our spiritual well-being as well. In fact, it's more than beneficial. The Bible tells us many times that it is absolutely vital, especially the book of Proverbs, which tells us in many different ways that God gives us good friendships to grow in godliness. It's a truth that is maybe best summed up in a a well-known verse that we're going to primarily land on today. Proverbs 27, verse 17, where King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, writes this about friendship. He says, iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. Such a memorable verse. I'm sure many, if not most of us, have heard it before, but we've probably never carefully studied it and considered what exactly Solomon is teaching here. And so that's what we're going to do this morning. We're simply going to take apart this this little verse and, and look at a few others as well that help us to understand it so that we can understand the great value of friendship in our Christian lives, okay? So we're going to start, first of all, by just considering the picture of this proverb, Now, you might have in the marginal notes uh, of your Bible, most translation have it, this way. Solomon literally writes, as as iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens the face of another. Now, that seems like kind of a strange expression until we realize that that Hebrew word is also used often in the Old Testament to describe the blade, or like the face, sometimes we'll talk a blade that way, Uh, the blade of an axe or a sword. And so with that understanding in mind, we can see what's going on here. Solomon was, you know, wandering around the palace, meditating on friendship when he came to the armory. And what does he see? He sees a swordsmith with an iron file and he's filing an iron sword. And he's like, that's it. That's what friendship's like. What a perfect illustration and image. As an iron file is used to sharpen an iron sword, improving its blade, so one faithful friend sharpens another, improving their their character and their countenance. And sure, like like a file grinding against a tool or against a blade, edifying friendships can be abrasive and unpleasant at times. Sparks may fly, But in the end, we are better off for it. Better off for those sharpening friendships. And especially, we grow in godly wisdom, which of course is what the whole book of Proverbs is about. Showing us how we can have godly wisdom, including this verse. Solomon writes elsewhere in Ecclesiastes 4.9, 
two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. Now, would you say that about the friendships God has given you in your lifetime? There is such a good reward. I am so much better off because of these godly friends in my life. I know I sure have. If I, if I think about my whole life from childhood through adulthood to today, a few key godly friends have had such a significant impact on my life. I can say I would not be who I am today apart from those godly friends. I'm so thankful for them. And yet, if I'm honest, I take those friends and have taken them often for granted. And I have not told them how thankful I am for them. I have not nurtured those friendships always as I should have. And maybe you would say the same. And maybe that's because what we tend to focus on when we're thinking about growth in the Christian life is things like reading scripture and prayer and public worship and private devotion. Of course, those things are absolutely vital for our growth in godliness. However, so is friendship. And yet it's so often overlooked. It's right there. And yet we so often overlook it. A number of years ago, I hit a large rock with our electric lawnmower, and uh, it bent the blade and, and, and dulled it really badly. So I was going to borrow a, a grinder from a neighbor, but I just never got around to it. Well, a few months after that, my father-in-law came to visit, and I told him about the blade, and so he disappeared, and then he came back a few minutes later, and ta-da, here's the blade, and it was perfect. It's like, how did you do that? He said, well, you had a file sitting in your shed, you know? Pretty simple, you just, you know, use it that way. Oh, it was right there, the perfect tool, an effective tool for sharpening the blade, and I had completely overlooked it. And I think that's how we are with friendship so often, too. It's this wonderful, effective tool that sharpens us spiritually, and yet how often do we take them for granted, friendships? How often do we overlook the great benefit they are to our Christian lives? They're right there, ready to be used. You know, I think about what the author of Hebrews says in Hebrews 10, 24. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good deeds. It's that idea again, that sharpening that friendships do in our lives. Okay, but we might wonder, what exactly is a good friend, then, that, that, that can do this? And how exactly do we sharpen each other in this way? Well, let's go on to consider the particulars of this proverb. Some of the words, first of all, the Hebrew word translated another here is specifically translated friend in verse 9 and 10 which I think is most likely what Solomon had in mind here in verse 17 too. In fact, some other English translations do translate it friend, not just another. And, and one reason I think this is clearly what he's talking about, not just relationships in general, but friendship, is because iron sharpens iron, thinking about that image, only if it is consistently making close and careful contact, right? which therefore implies consistent, close, and careful relationships or friendships. But the word here, the Hebrew word, can also be translated companion. And I think that's another helpful word, getting the idea of what a friend is. It's someone who accompanies you through life, through the highs and through the lows, through the good times and through the bad times. When you're at your best and when you're at your worst, a friend never leaves you. They don't give up on you, but stick with you. In other words, they're loyal. And then we see this in chapter 17 of Proverbs. Verse 17, the first part of that verse says this about a friend. A friend loves at all times. A friend is a companion who's there with you through it all. Many years ago, an English magazine offered a prize for the best definition of a friend, and thousands of entries came in, but this definition won. A friend is the one who comes in when the whole world has gone out. I think that's good. I found another more humorous definition of a friend. A friend is the person who, when you make a fool of yourself, doesn't think you've done a permanent job. <laughs> I like that too. A good place to start when we're thinking about friendship, but if we consider a few other pertinent passages in scripture, we get an even better definition. 
which includes two more essential things. Okay, this is what biblical friendship is. First of all, it involves regular face-to-face interactions. In Exodus 33, 11, we read an amazing statement about Moses' friendship with God. It says, Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. In other words, there was personal communication and communion on a regular basis. Which tells us that that God's idea of friendship, it's more than just being an acquaintance. It's more than being a buddy or a pal that you spend time with every once in a while. No, it involves this kind of intimate interaction. I mean, just imagine what what we're reading here, that God personally, somehow face-to-face, that we know not in in an ultimate sense, because when Moses said, God, can I see you? He said, well, you'll die if I do. But however this worked out, in, in the most intimate way possible for a human to be in the presence of God, God revealed his will regularly to Moses face to face, and then Moses poured out his heart to God face to face, something we see often, excuse me, in the Old Testament. That's the heart of friendship. And it's one of the greatest blessings we can experience in this life, having a friend. George Eliot said this, I love this, Oh, the comfort, the inexpressible comfort of feeling safe with a person, having neither to weigh thoughts nor measure words, but to pour them all out just as they are, chaff and grain together, knowing that a faithful hand will take and sift them, keep what is worth keeping, and then with the breath of kindness, blow the rest away. What a gift that is, to have those kind of relationships. Friendship involves this kind of regular face-to-face interaction, which then leads to the second part, the bonding of souls in mutual love. Deuteronomy 13.6 speaks of a friend who is as your own soul, which is the very same thing that was said about Jonathan and David and their famous friendship. In 1 Samuel 18, 1, it says, The soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. That is a remarkable statement of what biblical friendship should be and can be. A knitting together of souls. And let me just say this. This was speaking about men. Okay, I think we... we, Women, you might be thinking, yeah, that's what friendship's like. I've experienced that. And men are like, whoa, <laughs> that's, nope, <laughs> right? That's too close for me, too intimate for me. This was Jonathan and David, like two of the greatest warriors of all time. David, who was known for killing his tens of thousands, right? Like these were men's men. And it says their souls were knit together in mutual love. This is the heart of friendship as well. And love in the sense of this self-giving to each other. This self-giving that changes each other. Someone once said of friendship, some people come into our lives and quietly go. Others stay a while and leave footprints on our hearts. And we are never the same. Church, that's what real biblical friendship is like. That profoundly shapes us, that sharpens us spiritually as iron sharpens iron physically. Now, how? How exactly do these face-to-face, intimate, godly friendships do such things? Well, for one thing, we are just naturally influenced by those we spend time with, right? Likes and dislikes, habits and hang-ups, good behavior, bad behavior rub off on us. Which is why it's so important that we spend most of our time with godly friends. And we see this in Proverbs 13.20. Proverbs 13.20 says this. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. 
pointing out the importance of this and particularly choosing godly friends, Puritan Thomas Watson wrote, man being a sociable creature is mightily encouraged to do as others do, especially in an evil example. For we are more susceptible of evil than we are of good. Sickness is sooner communicated than health. Friends, we are just naturally influenced by those we're around, either towards godliness or, as he said here, away from godliness. But as we look at the immediate context of our text, we also discover two more specific ways that good and godly friends influence us to godliness. And this first is this. God, uh, good friends grow us in godliness first by their correction. So verses 5 and 6 of Proverbs 27. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. So in other words, a friend is willing to admonish and rebuke when needed. To call out sin and error. To wound his friend with constructive criticism in order to heal him. Like a surgeon who wounds, who cuts away the, the cancerous tumor in order to heal, not to harm. But that's not always easy, is it? I'm sure all of us would say that we are tempted to say nothing when we see friends going down a wrong path. Lest we upset them or we, we risk harming the friendship. Solomon says here that such silence is no better than the false flattery of an enemy. Real friends, he says, rebuke when needed. And humbly receive rebuke when needed. As we see in chapter 28. If you just look over to chapter 28, verse 23. Whoever rebukes a man will afterward find more favor than he who flatters with his tongue. I would say that's certainly true for me. My closest and dearest friends are those who've been willing to tell me hard things I don't want to hear because they love me too much. And they care about my well-being more than they care about maybe experiencing some tension. General Ulysses Grant had a problem with alcohol that had caused him a lot of trouble. And so during the Civil War, he promised his chief of staff and closest friend, John Rawlins, he would not drink again. A pledge that he soon broke, which put Rawlins in a very hard place. Would he risk confronting his commanding officer about the danger he was in? Well, Rollins did what all good friends are supposed to do, and he told Grant the truth in love, which was graciously received. In fact, Grant was so thankful for this rebuke of his friend, when no one else would tell him the truth, that he shortly after recommended Rollins to a promotion and said this about him, his friend, that he comes the nearest to being indispensable to me of any officer in the service. Good friends grow us in godliness by their correction. But then secondly, on the sort of flip side of that, they also do so by their counsel. So verse 9 in Proverbs 27 says this, Oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. So the advice of a friend, Solomon says, is as pleasant as perfume. It's one of the sweetest things about friendship. Why? Because it shows that they care. They care enough to carefully offer their input, to selflessly share their insight, which is truly invaluable. I would just say personally that this might be the, the greatest blessing I have experienced in my life from good and godly friends. When I have had especially a big decision to make, or when I've been especially perplexed about something, I have a list of close intimate friends that I go to right away for their godly advice and wisdom. And that has helped me make 
all of the good decisions I've ever made. It's because of their godly advice. And it is also what has saved me from all the bad decisions I could have made. Friends who gave me good and godly advice. And you know what? This is something we see throughout the Proverbs. If you want to be a wise person, you need to be open to the advice and counsel of others. In your notes, there's a few examples there, but just for time, we'll just look back at one in chapter 19, verse 20. 1920 says, listen to advice and accept instruction that you may gain wisdom in the future. Other passages talk about how the fool will not listen to advice, but the wise will. Former president of the United States, Woodrow Wilson, used to say, I not only use all the brains I have, but all the brains I can borrow too. Good friends likewise borrow and lend their brains to each other, which greatly grows us in godliness. Okay, but how do we get such friendships? How do we get friends who will borrow their brains to us, who will give us the counsel and the correction we need? Well, that takes us finally to the practice of this proverb. In the Hebrew, it's clear that Solomon, he's not just making an observation here. Hey, this is what friendship's like. But he's giving instruction. He's commanding the reader to do what he is describing here. Okay, don't just agree with this in principle, what I've presented, but put it into practice. He's saying, do whatever you can do to get such good and godly friendships. So that they can grow you and you can grow them in godliness together. And as we see in the rest of the Proverbs, uh, there's a few key ways we can do this. A few key ways, first of all, that we can get good friendships. If you go back to Proverbs 19, verses 6 to 7, Proverbs 19, 6 to 7 says this, Many seek the favor of a generous man, and everyone is a friend to a man who gives gifts. All a poor man's brothers hate him, how much more do his friends go far from him? Now, this, it seems, is a warning against false friends who are more interested in what they can get from you, and particularly your money or other benefits, than what they can give. But, you know, this also just provides for us a general principle that our attitudes and actions can either attract people to us or repel people from us. And so with that general principle in mind, what can we do to specifically attract good friends? I mean, if we have, he's saying if you've got lots of money and you give it away, you can get all kinds of friends. They might not be good friends. But that should get us wondering, okay, what can I do to attract good friends, godly friends? Well, first and foremost, listen to this. You can be the kind of good friend you are looking for. Think about it. If you were someone else, would you like to be your friend? Are you the kind of person who you would not naturally be drawn to in friendship? Think about that. It's so obvious, and yet it's so often missed. You can't expect to get good friends if you are not a good friend yourself. But if you are one, you will soon have one. You will soon have many friends. As an observant poet wrote, I went out to find a friend, but could not find one there. I went out to be a friend, and friends were everywhere. So true. Now, of course, the kind of friend that you and I and everybody wants to be is, first and foremost, courteous and caring. Someone who doesn't put us down, but builds us up, who has our best interests in mind. A principle that is plainly laid out in Proverbs 22, verse 11. Proverbs 22, 11 says this. He who loves purity of heart and whose speech is gracious will have the king as his friend. 
Simply put, no one likes to be around rude, abrasive, negative, critical people. It's unattractive. Who wants to be around anyone like that, right? But everyone likes to be around polite, thoughtful, positive, encouraging people. And so if you're having trouble making good friends, you might want to consider which describes you. Are you polite or are you rude? Are you abrasive or are you thoughtful? Are you negative or are you positive? Are you critical or are you encouraging? But even more so, what will attract good friends to you? Listen to this, so important. What will attract good friends to you more than anything else is if you are a good listener. And if you are sincerely interested in other people and in what interests them. This is a quality that is so lacking in our self-obsessed society. That if you can learn to do this, to be genuinely interested in others and a good listener, you will have good friends lining up at the door because it is sadly so rare. Someone wisely said, you can make more friends in two months by becoming interested in others than you can make in two years trying to get others interested in you. No wonder the book of Proverbs so often warns, so often warns about talking too much while commending those who wisely keep a tight rein on their tongues. We see this throughout scripture, don't we? The fool babbles on and on and on. The wise man listens carefully. In Proverbs 17, 27 is one example, 27 and 28 really. Whoever restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. I love this. Even a fool who keeps silent is considered wise. So there's a few tips from Proverbs on how to get good friendships. But we also find in Proverbs instructions about how to guard good friendships. Proverbs, uh, if you go just back to 1628, 1628 says this, a dishonest man spreads strife and a whisperer separates close friends. We read essentially the same thing uh, just in the next page, chapter 17, 9. Whoever covers an offense seeks love, but he who repeats a matter separates close friends. Simply put, those with loose lips will very quickly lose friends. They cannot keep a secret, but are quick to spread news that's not theirs to share. In other words, they gossip. On the other hand, those who are trustworthy have no trouble having friends. Those who can keep a confidence keep friends for life, which is such a precious gift. A recent survey found that more than 40,000 Americans, that the number one quality valued in friendship is the ability to keep confidences. That's what matters most to friends. And so that's one way we can guard good friendships. But then finally, Proverbs also tells us how to grow good friendships. We, we saw earlier in chapter 17, 17, uh, that uh, a friend loves at all times. And then if we go to chapter 18, verse 24, we read this, which just kind of builds on that. 1824 says, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. So we know mutual love, of course, is at the heart of good friendships. Well, as we see here, love is linked to loyalty. Loving at all times, being closer than a brother. That is the firm foundation on which all friendships grow. We will never experience this biblical iron sharpenings iron principle of friendship if we move on from one friend to the next every few years. If we abandon our friends, especially, 
at the moment when they need us the most. Two friends were out hunting when one looked up and saw a grizzly bear staring at him. He took off running. The other friend shouted out, hey, don't you know you can't outrun a bear? That's okay, I don't have to, the friend said. I only have to outrun you. <laughs> Not the kind of friend we would be looking for. But is that in other ways what our friendships might be like? As soon as it gets real, we're gone. As soon as being a friend means making sacrifices for their sake, we bow out. This is too much. I'll let someone else do that. As soon as we're giving more than we're getting out of a friendship, do we leave? Do we back off? You know, the most striking feature of good friendship in the Bible is the firm commitment to having a level, loving loyalty for friends, especially when they are going through difficult times. I think of the many faithful friends of the Apostle Paul who didn't abandon him when he suffered greatly for the gospel in prison. Timothy, who in Philippians 2 says, did not seek his own interest, but served Paul while in prison. Or Epaphroditus, who ministered to Paul while imprisoned in Rome. Or most notably, Onesiphorus, who in 2 Timothy 1, Paul says, didn't turn, turn away from him when everyone else did, but earnestly found Paul and refreshed him and was not ashamed of his chains. That's a good example of real friendship and how to grow it. And yet the greatest example, of course, of faithful friendship is found in Jesus Christ. And specifically in the cross where he demonstrated the loyal love of friendship more than anywhere else, through which his death he reconciled us to God so that we could be called his friends. He sacrificed everything. He laid down his life in loyal love for us. John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. That right there is the very essence of biblical friendship. The gospel shows us more clearly than anywhere else what it means to be a good friend, which is something we all should want to be and want to experience. Because God gives us good friends to grow in godliness. That's what we've just seen. It's one of the main ways that the Lord sharpens us spiritually and likewise that we can then sharpen others mutually. And so if you have those kind of friendships already today, let me just encourage you, thank God for them and go and tell your friends how much you appreciate them and do what you can to nurture and guard those relationships because they are a precious gift. But if you don't feel like you have those kinds of friendships just yet, I would encourage you today to start to pray about it, to ask God to, first of all, make you the kind of good friend you want to have. And then secondly, place in your, in your life the kind of good friends you need. Because although we can do much to attract friends to us, as we saw earlier, only God can providentially put the friends in our lives that we need by his grace. C.S. Lewis once pointed out, in friendship, we think we have chosen our peers. In reality, a few years difference in the dates of our birth, a few more miles between certain houses, the choice of one university instead of another, the accident of a topic being raised or not raised at a first meeting, any of these chances might have kept us apart. But for a Christian, there are strictly speaking no chances. A secret master of ceremonies has been at work. Christ, who said to his disciples, Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, can truly say to every group of Christian friends, You have not chosen one another, but I have chosen you for one another. The friendship is not a reward for our discriminating and good taste in finding another out. It is the instrument by which God reveals to each of us the beauties of others. Isn't that great? And isn't that true? What a gift good friends are from God.
And so let's value them. Let's be them. Let's seek them. Let's pray for them. Let's thank God for them. Let's nurture them. Trusting he will give us the good friends we need. If we ask. I think that God will never send a gift so precious as a friend. A friend who always understands and fills each need as it demands. Whose loyalty will stand the test when skies are bright or overcast. Who sees the faults and merit blame but keeps on loving just the same. Who does far more than creeds could do to make us good, to make us true. Earth's gifts a sweetest contentment lend. But only God can give a friend. Lord, we are thankful for the gift of friendship. Thankful for the friends you have put in our lives, who have made such a difference in them. Particularly the good and godly friends who have sharpened us spiritually, who have influenced us towards godliness. Help us to be thankful for them, to show our gratitude and to nurture those friendships. But also, Lord, for those who maybe don't feel like right now they have those friendships, that you would give those friendships to them, that you would be shaping them into the kind of friends they're looking for. And Lord, that as a people, as a church, we would grow in our friendships with one another so that we can become more like you, Jesus. We pray this in your precious name. Amen.